Once again, uh, I want to make sure you're all recording your questions and comments uh, for uh, the Q&A period, which will follow the next presentation by Dr. Terry Richmond. Dr. Richmond is passionate about nursing science to prevent injury and violence and improve outcomes, particularly in patients from vulnerable urban populations. Uh, she specializes in nursing care for victims of injury and violence and um, co-founded the, the Firearm and Injury Center at Penn, now known, um, uh, now known as um, Penn Injury Science Center. She is currently Andrea B. Laporte Professor and the um, Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Nursing. Uh, her full bio is, is in the material. On a personal note, uh, I think uh, congratulations are due to Terry for her induction to the National Academy of Medicine this past weekend. So congratulations thank on that. Thank you, thank you. So we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm thrilled to be here and thanks uh, the National Academy of Medicine for inviting me and actually for being on the planning committee. I took my name off the podium because I'm short enough that I can't make eye contact <laughs> if I have to look over the name tag. So um, you'll, you know who I am. I uh, was charged with talking about the psychological and social burden of fire and violence in communities. And I'm thrilled to do that because that really is, I've always approached fire and violence as a biopsychosocial disease and it's nice to really make that case. Um, I really have no disclosures, but I would like just to acknowledge up front the research I'll be using to exemplify points has been funded by NIMH, NIMHD, NINR, CDC, and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. So I would just like to acknowledge the importance of that um, in helping us build knowledge around the area of fire and violence. So fire and violence is a determinant of health and well-being. We think about other factors driving fire and violence, but fire and violence itself is a determinant of health and well-being. It affects individuals, communities, society as a whole, and it affects our health care systems. So as I talk about the impact on communities, remember communities are made up of individuals, families, institutions, organizations, health care systems. Fire and violence is also inextricably tied to race and inequity. We can't talk about this without talking about race and inequity. It's related to poverty and poor housing, limited access to healthy food and educational opportunities, lack of safe places to work, live, play, walk, and socialize. That, all of these factors directly impact health. So if we want healthy people in our communities and in our healthcare systems, we must address firearm violence. So I'm, I've organized this to make a point and then use some science to support the point that I'm making. So the first point I'd like to make is the burden of fire and violence affects all of us. It affects all of us. And why is this important? I'll answer that first. It's important because if we don't believe it's our problem, we have no incentive to solve the problem. That's true individually, that's true from families, it's certainly true from health systems. I, in Pennsylvania, I, you know, it's viewed as a Philadelphia problem, not a middle of Pennsylvania problem. I just returned from Washington State and I drove from Seattle to Spokane. In Spokane, it was viewed as Seattle's problem. It's all of our problems and that's extraordinarily important. To support that point, this is a study we published years ago from our team that was led by Charlie Brown, who's now at Columbia University, that looked at the urban-rural um, uh, nature of fire and violence to try to get at the fact that it's not solely an urban problem. And we looked, we used the U.S. Department of Agriculture urban-rural continuum. And what we found was certainly fire and homicide was much more likely in in urban America, but firearm suicide was much more likely in rural America. And in you know, carefully adjusted multiple regression analysis, this top right um, uh, figure shows that essentially when you combine firearm homicide and firearm suicide, it is everybody's problem. So we must acknowledge that. 
The second supporting point for why it's everybody's problem is a recent paper that came out by Callison, Weinberg, and Galea on gun violence in American social network during their lifetime. And they make the case that almost everybody at some point in their lifetime has somebody in their social network that's affected by gun violence. So that says not only do we think geographically, but we think within our social networks, it affects all of us. It affects non-whites more than it affects the white communities, but across all communities, we have high uh, potential for feeling the burden of gun violence um, across our lifetime. The second point I'd like to make, and this is relevant to this workshop in particular, is you must know the burden of firearm violence within your own health care system. Why is this important? I'm going to answer that first and then and give you examples. It's important, it's, I'm a nurse practitioner, and it's important from a differential diagnosis perspective. If I don't correctly diagnose the problem, it doesn't matter what intervention I'm giving because it's not really going to take care of the, of the, of the problem because I've misdiagnosed it. So from a differential diagnosis perspective, it's important for your health system where you live, the people that you serve, to understand the nature of the burden of fire and violence within your own healthcare system. And I'm gonna pull up a, a older study that we did, but that really exemplifies this point. This is a paper we published in the early 2000s, and it was looking at trauma center partnerships to address firearm injury a new paradigm. It, I don't know if it was new then, but it seemed new to us, and I think it's exactly where Kaiser is going right now. We looked at three small to medium-sized cities, and within each city, the trauma center was sort of the center of the hub with an advisory board, community coalitions, local data sources. This was before we even had the National Violent Death Reporting System. So people had a hard time really getting local data to understand their problem in relation to other, to other cities or the nation as a whole. We actually used the firearm injury reporting system that Steve Hargarten developed, so we've known each other for a long time, and that really became the template for the NVDRS. But this was an interesting study. We were based in Ohio, Iowa, and Pennsylvania, three very different states with three very different small and medium-sized cities. I'm going to tell you the story of one community, and that's the community in Pennsylvania. This community was identified as a gun-toting community. It was a gun-toting community. They did not necessarily want us to come in and look at the burden of fire and violence in that community. But what really um, stimulated it was they wanted to get data to secure law enforcement money to address what they identified their problem to be. And that was gun homicide was the major problem, but it wasn't really their problem. It was from drug runners from New York to Point South. All right, so you with me? A, it wasn't their problem, and B, um, it was gun homicide. To make a long story short, as we gather all the data from coroners, medical examiners, police, healthcare systems, etc., lo and behold, what we found when we look at the death rate in red here, it really wasn't homicide that was the problem, it was suicide in this community. Um, so when we looked at the burden of what they should be addressing, it was firearm suicide. So, so that was an important piece of information. Not that we shouldn't care about, about homicides, but suicide was more of a burden in their community. As we talked to them, and we actually presented to city council and the health system to say, what can we do? Essentially, the burden was with older white men, right, for firearm suicide, which is not surprising. And actually, in, in the first meeting within this community, it was, well, if old people want to kill themselves, that's fine. As a nurse, I said, that's really not acceptable to, to me. And, and tried to, you know, it's, it was great being a nurse. Like, really? Like, I'm not going to buy that. So, but the numbers didn't do anything for them. So one of the things we had access to was all the narrative notes 
suicide notes, medical examiner coroner notes. And here's one example of what we did. We wanted to further understand the burden, right? Because again, it's where do we intervene? And medical illness and il elderly, and I'm just gonna take this, we had another one for adolescent firearm suicide, but this one really broke down into fear of being a burden and to being dependent, unrelieved pain and pain impairing function, depressive symptoms, social isolation, and a terminal state. So very few were in that terminal state. All other situations, can we treat depression? Can we treat depression? Can we deal with social isolation? That's a hot topic right now in the Jero community. Can we deal with pain more effectively? Absolutely. So we, we married the data for th that we had to really mobilize the health system to say we can take this on, we can put together task forces to address these things. This is within our purview. The third point I'd like to make is we need to understand the burden borne by people injured by firearms. George talked about our charge, which was primary prevention, and really I think we recast that charge a little bit to those at high risk, higher risk for firearm violence as we thought about this. We need to think about the burden borne by people injured by firearms within your health system to make the case why do we intervene and stop it to begin with? Like, why do we want to do fi primary prevention? And do we adequately address the burden? I'm going to say the answer is no. I don't think we do. Um, and I'll give you some cases. This is, these are narratives from a study. I have a cohort study of 623 seriously injured black men. 55% were violently injured predominantly from firearm violence. This is the emotional responses. So when Steve talks about integrating behavioral health and physical health and injury care, this is incredibly important. I wake up and have anxiety attacks. My mind is going a thousand places at once. I'm scared to walk around everywhere, scared to go outside, scared to go in my neighborhood because maybe that same person is trying to come after me. Not knowing who did it. Is it somebody I work with? Is it somebody who lives next door to us? So just the fear of not knowing that person who did that to me could be standing right next to me. So the psychological outcomes are profound. And I would posit that as trauma centers, healthcare systems, et cetera, we're not dealing with this within our own systems in an optimal may, way that I believe that we can. Why do we care about that fallout? This is a, 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 a schematic by my colleague John Rich at Drexel University. And this is John, John did, this is maybe 10 years old, but it's so true, looking at injury. And then if we don't deal with the psychological fallout, for example, symptoms of traumatic stress, we see people using illicit substances, we see feeling like a sucker and wanting to retaliate, lack of faith in police, disrupted senses of safety, and the likelihood of re-injury. And the likelihood of re-injury is very large in this population. So if we're looking for a point of intervention, this population with unmet psychological needs after their first injury are targets for intervention and targets that we should take very, very seriously. It also, and I'll add to the schematic, what we see is much more likely to, to have interactions with the criminal justice system versus the healthcare system, when really the core need is health. Another reason I think we're not adequately meeting the psychological needs of people injured with firearm violence, and in this case, I'm really talking about <coughs> firearm assault. This was in the same cohort of injured black men, we did a study, we did a study, we, we asked them, why did you choose to enter a research study? Because this is a hard to recruit and hard to retain group. We've done a fabulous job. And we sort of wanted to understand from their perspective. The number one reason they entered the research study was for human connection. 
And I tell you, when I f we first were looking at the data and trying to come up with a label, a part of me deep down inside almost wanted to say healthcare system neglect, that we were not connecting with these men as human beings holistically in looking at their psychological needs, that they came into a research study because they wanted a chance to share their story, to tell somebody about it, to tell how they felt. I think clearly there's evidence that we can up our game when we think about the psychological and social burden of this. One of the challenges, and I think the healthcare systems need to think about this, is often these psychological responses occur after people are discharged. So you may have a captive population, but if it's not fully integrated, once they leave our care, let's say it's trauma injury, they often become symptomatic without knowing how to get help or that they even need help. This schematic also comes from a, a co this cohort, and it was if people, look at the red box, if people thought they needed help, and they acknowledged it, the barriers they identified, sociocultural batter, ba barriers, the providers don't look like me, they don't live like me, and they will not understand me. The fear of judgment, and I'll give you some quotes to exemplify that. Limited access to mental health services. Even though we have behavioral health services in the city of Philadelphia, it was viewed that there was limited help, um, access and prof professional help was deemed ineffective. You can't do anything for me. So there are problems with the burden here that we can step up to the plate and we should step up to the plate because if these remain unmet, the chance for re-injury is high. Here's some of the quotes about help seeking. I don't want to end up in a straitjacket or someone telling me I'm crazy, that I'm a harm to myself or others because I'm not. I don't know who to talk to. Tell me which way to go, how to get counseling. So clearly as we discharge these patients from our care, in an injury perspective, we did not provide a segue or a bridge for that. This is to me the, the saddest quote. They would look at me and say I'm crazy or stupid or just like I don't matter. So we need to step up the game to deal with this burden if we want to decrease re-injury. We need to break down the silos. This is an editorial commentary I wrote for Journal of Trauma in 2005, so that was 13 years ago, my gosh. We're remiss if we don't address the acute psychological responses with the same steely resolve that we address airway, breathing, and circulation. No longer can psychological assessment be viewed as a nice add-on. It must be integrated into the very essence of trauma care if we're to improve the outcomes of survivors of serious injury. Absolutely. And I, today, as I think about this, I say we need to integrate that way prior to the index injury where I see it, for example, as an injury clinician. We are siloed. Maybe you're not, but I, my perspective from what I see, silos still exist and it's problematic. The burden of firearm violence on the community. Why is it important? I'll answer the why is it important first. It's important because we see children and families injured when they're not shot. If I live in a community with pervasive violence and firearm violence, I have significant health effects because of that. So it's important because the burden is not just when you're physically injured. This is a beautiful view. This is a University of Pennsylvania photo looking into Center City, Philadelphia. I have never quite seen this view, nor a rainbow <laughs> outside my window, but it's a beautiful view. This is 20 blocks away at my community partner's headquarter location. 
So we need to understand our communities. We need to understand it fully outside of our healthcare systems. There's an economic burden from firearm violence. Steve made the point, I think George made the point, so I won't reiterate this, but this was the cost of hospitalization in a recent paper from Cory Peak Asa. So really, economic burden, and this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cost of firearm violence. Child well-being. This is based on a set of surveys we did in West and Southwest Philadelphia on community violence exposure in children. 95% heard about community violence, 87% directly witnessed, 54% have been directly victimized. This affects child health and well being. What the youth say, and here's a couple quotes for living in these communities. A little boy got shot around the corner. My mom don't like for us to hang out because kids might get caught in the crossfire. In fact, we found parents keeping kids captive in their homes. How can that be healthy when we think about prevention of chronic disease? In the swimming pool area is fine, but the basketball is, court is mostly fine. It's just late at night. When some games are going on, little fights break out and a couple shootings happen. Like that's like a normal thing. So this, the burden on communities and on children is significant. Indeed, this is a King Sussing Rec Center where all of our community meetings are held, where the children play, where we have six people injured in a shooting at this rec center. This is the exposure. This has health effects and well-being effects without ever having been injured. Why do we care about child health and well-being? Increased risk of violent offending, poor academic performance, increased depression, suicidal ideation, allostatic load, chronic toxic stress, shorter telomere lengths. The recent paper from Kat Tiao from New Orleans shows shorter telomere lengths, all of which don't bode well for the health of children living in these communities. The impact, the social burden on educational attainment, my community partners wanted to, the Housing Plus Agency. If you think poverty impacts health, then getting out of poverty improves health. Education is a way to get out of poverty. We looked um, at a, a group of 150 housing units in a Housing Plus Agency where people were really pretty randomly assigned because it was the next un the housing unit up and found that if you lived on a high crime block, you, had less you were less likely or you had less educational credit accrual than people who lived on medium and low crime blocks. So the virtue of where you live at a very precise micro neighborhood level is important. The Atlantic picked this up and one could say, gosh, I can't change the block and, it, and, and I think as health systems think about population science, changing the neighborhoods where people live have the potential to reduce injury and health problems from firearm violence. We can change it block by block by block and have an effect on people's health and on reducing firearm violence. The social burdens, we see the social burden. We have metal detectors in schools. The Philadelphia school system doesn't have enough books, budget, to buy books for all the students, but we have metal detectors in schools. We have metal detectors at, so, at so, you know, sporting events, churches, and here's a medical dete metal detector in an emergency department. My husband dropped to the floor at the supermarket one day. I, in 30 seconds, diagnosed him with a, a kidney stone popped him in the car, took him to the emergency department, dropped him off, and he had to go through a metal detector to get care. The burden on our health care system is significant. This is our trauma resuscitation area. A is we put a lot of resources into caring for gunshot um, victims. B, I want to recast, and this is again a diagnosis issue, we pay a lot of attention to mass shootings, and I am in no way minimizing mass shootings. 
They're significant, but we have mass shootings every single day. We're shooting people every single day, and that is a significant burden. This was the Parkland High School shooting. This was our trauma alert in the same 24 hours of the, of the Parkland, um, uh, the, the high school shooting in Parkland, Florida. The same 24 hours, trauma alert, gunshot wound, trauma alert, gunshot wound, trauma alert, gunshot wound, gunshot wound, gunshot wound, gunshot wound, gunshot wound. We're seeing this every single day, so the burden is extensive. We think of our, our care of, of injured patients as something that happens in the healthcare system. And as I close, I want to make this point because this has provided, this has created issues for us and patient care. HIPAA, we all know about HIPAA, we all sign our release so that, so that you know, I can get my drugs at the drugstore, et cetera. But HIPAA, trauma resuscitation, we see patients come in and we're resuscitating them. By virtue of the fact in Philadelphia, we actually have a policy that Philadelphia police put shot patients in the backseat of police cars and bring them to the, to the trauma centers. That gives police entree into the trauma centers. At the same time that we're trying to resuscitate, we now have police in the resuscitation. They've delivered patients to us. And it's primarily from poor urban black neighborhoods that we see this happening. It's become such an issue for us. We started really taking a look at it as a, um, the intersection of healthcare, law enforcement, and race. This has direct impact on our healthcare systems. And patients' perspectives, they ask so many questions. I'm trying to let them know I couldn't talk. I'm getting ready to die. And we're providing health healthcare. So my final slide here is we felt, we see this as such an issue in terms of entree because of gun violence, of, of law enforcement into our resuscitation areas. We just published a health affair blogs looking at we need to think about policies that really guide broader rather than the ad hoc um, decisions that are made in clinical settings. Patient health first priority, patient rights second, and how do we deal with it from a provider perspective. So I hope as I end that I've made the case the burden is significant, that we need to, it's a burden for all of us, that healthcare systems need to know what is the burden specific to your healthcare system if you're gonna institute interventions that look at people who are already injured and deal with those issues to re decrease re-injury that will help decrease the burden and recognize the burden in your communities. So on that note, um, thank you so much. Thank you very much.